Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 333 for Monday, January 17th, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. What's up, everybody here in Napomo, California? Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. Kent? Doing pretty good. You know, the we're here, what, 17 days into the month. I've been working pretty hard on scheduling and, you know, pretty much out through September. Um, I've got a pretty good idea what my year is going to look like, at least through September. Yeah. And I'll be able to spend a fair amount of time really, for the first time, going out and trying to get a full holiday calendar next year, right? Like oh, putting together right. putting yeah. together a plan where I'm going to try and, you know, ask people to book us instead of wait for people to find us and book us, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I think I'm pretty much ahead of it, as I've been sharing with you. I've marked out the weekends that I'm going to go up to where I the house rockers are, and yep. um, that calendar's filling in great. And then the amount of work I have, I'd like there to be more stuff down here, but there's some, and it's getting there. And uh, so uh, the down here stuff is doing really well. I played a gig, a solo acoustic gig at, at a golf course the other day, uh, and it went really well, and they were really happy with it. And the bookers already said, "Yeah, you're going to be pretty regular there." So, and that's that's that, down in your new area, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. So, that's congrats. That's great. Yeah, and then um, I actually like a little bit of news. You don't even know this. I don't. But uh, <laughs> um, one of the places that I play regularly asked me if I would bring a trio in to do. So I've I've uh, I've put together a trio. It's Basically, the the set list that I do up in Northern California with that band and the coffee house that I do, I'm just basically taking that. So I'm not learning a whole new you know show, basically. Right. Giving it to these guys. And so I'm going to try it as a trio. And the reason I say you don't know this is because I think we had the conversation where I said, I don't have an interest in putting together a band down here. <laughs> I, 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 that, that was echoing in my head. But, you know, sometimes uh, the best ideas are someone else's. And yeah. and this sounds like somebody else's idea. I, in fact, I would say yeah. uh, I could say that about this show because this show is a fantastic idea, but it it was yours, it wasn't mine. So it's some it was somebody else's. <laughs> well, you you always say that, but we were having those phone conversations regularly anyway. So it was more like, hey, my buddy who I talked to music about, who also happened to own a, a media podcast company, <laughs> right? So it wasn't a, it wasn't exactly what I would call a large leap. <laughs> no, it wasn't a large leap, but it certainly wasn't one that I think thought to take. Uh, so you know, there you go. Yeah, I, I, I every business that I've been in, I, I think, has been someone else's idea, at least the successful ones. So it's just fine. But you know, it's all it's about execution. Skill. But yeah. it's a skill to recognize, you know, which which the right things are to get into, right? So totally. Yeah. yeah. I've, and I've failed at that many times, too, but I've succeeded enough that I get to keep doing things. So there you that's go. all you have to do. That's, that's all you got to do. That's all you have to do. Yeah, it doesn't matter how many times you fail as long as you hit a couple of yeah. a couple of doubles off the wall, maybe a triple here. Yeah. Lord, Lord forbid uh, you hit a home run every once in a while. Yeah, I, I, you don't plan for the home runs, and I, I wouldn't – I don't know that I've ever hit one. If I have, I, I'm not quite aware of it yet. But, you know, singles and doubles are pretty good. <laughs> So, Your wife, you hit a home run there. Well, see, there you go. That's, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the bands I've been in and felt like home runs. In fact, the bands I'm in now feel like home runs. So there you go. There you go. Yeah, it's yeah. good. It's good. I, I think that, that Lennon, John Lennon quote about life is what happens when you're busy making other plans is the, mo other plans is the most useful life lesson that there is. I mean, you, you go and you plan and you go do stuff, and then some really cool thing that wasn't even in your field of vision yeah. all of a sudden becomes a fully realized idea and then it, it works out great. That makes life and certainly a musical life quite rewarding. I agree. I ag agree. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Hey, I have an idea to talk about something today. Um, well, okay. I, I, I did want to talk about a gig that I have coming up because I think oh, there's please. some things going on that might be relevant to the, the folks who are listening. Uh, so I do. I have a Bitter Pill gig on Saturday night at Flight Coffee. We've played there once before. I think once before. Certainly at least once before. Maybe twice. Uh -huh. And uh, it, we will be doing this without a rehearsal. 
which means that there are songs that we will be playing live for the first time, songs that are going to be on the new record that we haven't done yet. I think I got to look at the set list again, but it nothing on there looks scary, but it was definitely like, okay, well, I got to like refresh myself and learn some of these songs. You got to learn how to play because mm -hmm. you know, what happens in the studio isn't necessarily what just sort of would come out naturally. And it's like, oh yeah, I got to relearn what these songs actually are. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but it is, I think it's worth having a COVID conversation here. Uh, a, it's an, doubt. well, more so than, than you might think. Uh, a, it's an indoor gig. And so there's all this stuff, but B, uh, fortunately I will be past my, certainly past my five day and, and well past my 10 day quarantine, uh, period of having, uh, tested positive for COVID. Oh, I did not know. I know. Yeah, I haven't made a big deal out of it because it, quite thankfully, has not been a big deal. The people in the band know. Uh, people in both the bands that I'm in know, obviously, because I want to make sure everybody's you know comfortable with everything. But yeah, without getting into all the the details, uh, well, I thought I had COVID three weeks ago. I think I said that on the show, and I tested like crazy, and it you know all the tests came back negative. I was like, okay, well, mm -hmm. you know, had the symptoms of the what what we now are calling the mild COVID, the Omicron stuff for vaxxed people. Like, you know, it felt like a cold with a sore throat. Okay, great. Tested like crazy, nothing. Uh, somebody else in my house wound up with the same symptoms, and we were like, yeah, okay, well, it's not COVID, but you got whatever you got from me. Great. And then there was reason for. Uh, this other person in the house to to test ahead of uh, a, a thing they need to do where they need to show a negative test. And I said, hey, you know, we're more than five days out from when you need to test for that, which is the five day CDC quarantine. I said, well, take an at home test just because the last thing you want is to find out that you're positive and then have to delay all these other things that you're going to do with your life. And so it's like, great, great. And then sure enough, that came back positive. I was like, huh, well, that's interesting. And so we all started testing. And with um, th that day, I did not test positive oddly, but the next day I did. And it was like, okay, that's not a surprise. In fact, it's, it's a surprise that, that, it, it, that it didn't happen before this. But in the last week plus, there have been a series, tons, in fact, of at-home antigen tests done uh, some just because we wanted to see where things were, but also I, I, I became friendly with this company that, that makes these at home tests. And I told the guy I, I was positive and he was like, Oh, will you test this way and try it this way and try it this way. You know, I, I became his Guinea pig, which was fine, but it meant there's been lots of tests and, and they've all come back at, you know, as expected as they were positive. Mm -hmm. But my first PCR, which was done on the same day as one of these antigens that came back super positive, my first PCR was negative and then my second PCR was positive. So like, I don't know. I think the reality is there's, especially here in, in new England right now, but probably going to happen throughout the country in, in it, you know, in its own phases and waves. I, I think there are a lot of people walking around with COVID that have no idea. We would not have known if it weren't for deciding to be proactive, you know, for this other thing and saying like, yeah, we should just, just like, you know, let's rule it out kind of thing. And, and, and we've been, you know, I've been nuts about testing all the way through. So I have at home tests, I, you know, like I'm fully prepared for all of this. So it was just like, yeah, yeah, just go grab one of the tests. It's fine. You know, go do it. And, but not everybody is in that position right now. And not everybody thinks about it that way. And I don't say that judgmentally. I just say it as a matter of fact. So I think there's a lot of people that either have zero symptoms or, you know, the mildest of symptoms that they don't really notice, or they test a couple of times and say, oh yeah, I was negative. And then they don't bother testing again. Like me, you know, I wouldn't have done it again if it weren't for, uh, you know, this, this other circumstance. So I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of COVID going around right now. Uh, yeah, there is. Is what it is. And I, I think unless you don't leave your house, I think you will be exposed to it. The good news is that's only two. That's what Fauci said, right? What's that? That's what, yeah, I Fauci guess that's true. He thinks everybody's going to get it now. Mm hmm. Well, I, I've checked the box, my friend. So, you know, there it is. Um, I think the thing is, so. But I not everybody in my house has tested positive, and we've been crazy about, you know, checking everybody, and it's it hasn't yep. been all of us, which is also I, just strange. But, yeah, but. Well, my daughter actually had it. She lives in a small apartment in New York City, and her husband didn't get it. They, you know, yeah. 
you know, the, the quarantining in a little apartment is a pretty impractical thing. No, it's I mean, in, they, yeah. They both it, very yeah. vaxxed and all that type of stuff. Right, so, right. I, let, let me say this. So I have a gig coming up and I have a rehearsal, a house rockers rehearsal coming up and there's a whole bunch of discussion, right? Um, here's the thing about the gig. Um, when we started this, I had a very strong opinion that, you know, musicians need to suck it up and not be the catalyst for getting people, you know, to gather together. Sure. This is, you know, this is when all this started, right? Yeah. So that's March 19, right? March 2020. Please March, don't, March please don't 20, make this yeah. last a year longer yeah, yeah. than it has. <laughs> well, in the, on the on the hindsight. Um, yeah. So March 2020, you know, my yep. opinion was, and then, and then counties and, you know, CDC started kicking in with very specific advice. And that kind of guided, you know, sh sh shelter in place and stay at home and, you know, yeah, yeah. all the type of stuff. The odd thing now is what I don't really understand, at least out here, uh, yes, this thing is raging, but counties are not saying much, at least out in California. I know what you're hearing. Yeah. And I actually just sent you a, a something that could be good to share in the show notes that, that you know, county uh, health experts are saying, like, listen, we don't have to shut down. Get vaccinated is is the big thing. And, you know, I think the county requirements now are if you're if you're doing something that you can't do with a mask, you can do it, but otherwise wear a mask. So if you need to eat or drink something in a restaurant, you know, you can take the mask off. But other than that, you should probably wear a mask. But it's not like they're not shutting stuff down. And I don't know whether that's a backlash of political will or what the heck is going on. But if if it's not illegal to do this stuff, why shouldn't we continue, right? If if the counties are not saying yeah. it is a public health crisis for, for people to gather, or are they say, or you know, was the other read of this? Listen, if you're vaccinated, you're, you know, the Omicron numbers are are the data is pretty good. You're not going to die, and you're probably not going to go to the hospital either. You know, you might not even we, know that you had it. Like, that's, right? <laughs> right? It's like, no, yeah. it, it is. We are now to the point of the evolution of this whole thing where it's okay to make the intelligent guess that if you're vaccinated, you know, you're probably not contributing to a, a public health catastrophe. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think it might even be simpler than than that. But I, I agree with you that, like, this has been the progression of it. And at the beginning, there were no options to get together, right? Like, so if if you or your band figured out something and said, okay, look, we're going to do it, you know, it, we're like this, let's talk, you know, April of 2020, right? May uh -huh. of 2020, whatever. If you said, all right, you know, screw it. We're just going to do it. Like that would be the only opportunity that people would have or or one of the very, very few to actually go in and do something social. Right. Like th there was nothing else back then. Right. So if your band was was the one leading the charge there, you were creating an opportunity for people to get together, perhaps irresponsibly. In retrospect, that probably w would have been the case at the time. You know, we had no idea of knowing anything. Right. But but it seemed realistic that that would have been, you know, irresponsible. And if people didn't if you didn't offer this, people probably would have stayed home because there was nothing else to do. But right now there's plenty else to do. Everything's open. Like you said, you know, the, the, the guidance is if you're vaxxed. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to misinterpret things, but one way of interpreting the guidance is if you're vaxxed, don't worry about it. I know that's not exactly what they're saying, but that's how a lot that's of people, an oversimplification. That's an yeah. oversimplification. Right. But you know, the, it's, it's very different than it was, you know, uh, whatever, 20 months ago or something. Yeah. So, and I, I think choosing to play a gig is not creating that is not an irresponsible thing right now. It, it, it's very different the, in terms of public responsibility than it was back, you know, when there was nothing. If if we don't play this gig or even if we do play this gig on Saturday, people will have plenty of things to do whether or not we play this gig. Right. Yeah. So I, I get from that standpoint. And that's been the case, especially around here for quite some time for, you know, not maybe not quite a year, but almost, you know, certainly eight months. And so I, you know, I don't feel, I don't feel that sense of responsibility playing a gig right now. People, right, so that, people know. Here's one angle we got to take on this though, that yeah. I think is the responsible angle. Yeah. And that is, well, two things. One is the sheer number of cases does mean that, you know, hospitals can get full. And that means people who, 
who need a hospital might not be able to get a hospital bed, right? Sure. Yeah. That's that's you know one of the main things that have been a catalyst for all this stuff is like we have to you have a fragile healthcare system that has limits to its capacity, and we have to you know deal with that. And then, so that's one thing. And, and, that, and I don't that's know, very, I don't know how to, how to different. balance that in my mind. That's very different now than it was the last time we had this wave though. Like, especially at least around here. And again, I can only, you know, I haven't, I've been paying more attention locally than, than of course nationally, but the, our hospitals are again overloaded, but for different reasons. Uh, one problem is we have a whole lot fewer healthcare workers around here. Mm. Uh, because people have either chosen to retire or move to different professions. I'll let you guess, yeah. guess why. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then the other yeah. issue is people are showing up at the hospital for whatever, you know, knee surgery or, you know, whatever they need. And of course they're testing everybody. And here it's like 40% of the people that show up for non COVID reasons, wind up testing positive for COVID. And right. then they have to be put into isolation rooms, not because right. they have symptoms, but because they've tested, you know, and, and that means more staff per person, more space per person. And that's what's filling up the hospitals this time. I think in Manhattan, it's 70% of the people that were showing up are, are like but surprise push or, COVID. Push come shove, what the point yeah. is, is that if you get in a car accident and you need a, a mm -hmm. hospital bed, it's not a good thing if there's not a hospital bed for you, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, probably wasn't your fault that you were in that that uh, car accident, you should be able to expect to get health well, we'll, insurance. Well, we'll call it a car incident until we have more information that such yeah. that we can call it an accident. But yes, right. probably not your fault. That's so right. then here's the other thing. One of the guys in my band had COVID uh, la not too long into the process. Okay. You know, summer, summer of 2020. Sure. And um, he's concerned now that, you know, the long-term effects of lung scarring, he needs his lungs to do what he does. Yeah. Um, you know, he's like, hey, you know, I, I get it. I'm probably not going to get sick and die. But, you know, what else is going to happen to me that's going to affect my career? I mean, I'm a full-time musician. You know, I, it took me a really long time to get my lung capacity back the first time. So, yes, I may not die because I can't breathe. But what are the other effects that I need to be conscious about sure. and worried about? So he's he's particularly cautious and concerned about this stuff. And that, you know, makes total sense to me. I mean, that's that's his living, right? So... There are parts of this that are still weird. I still don't really – We the biggest thing of this conversation is that you and I are, are reading between the lines to try and get some meaning out of what public health officials are trying to tell us. Net-net, in California, public health officials are not shutting stuff down, telling you to shelter in place. They're saying, net-net, you, you get vaccinated and you know wear a mask when you can. That's that's pretty. And what does that mean? Does that mean it's safe to go out? I guess it does. Right. Because yep. they're certainly not saying otherwise. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we're basically the same here. We don't have mask mandates in New Hampshire. I think you do in California. If, yeah. if I remember. Yeah, exactly. We do. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, that's generally the thing. And, you know, the the the, um, the thing I, I think that's it's important to to share here for the audience is how you deal with it in your own band. Right. Like you've got a guy who's who has his own reasons for being concerned about this and they're completely valid because they're his reasons. Right. So, and that's fine. And we have had the same conversations, you know, in, in, uh, in, well, both the bands, but bitter pills, the only one with a gig on the schedule right now, where it's like, if anybody in the band is uncomfortable with a gig for, for really for any reason, but you know, COVID might be the, the most uh, common one then veto power is okay. Like if anybody yeah. in the band, you know, we have this gig coming up Saturday. If somebody on, on Tuesday or Wednesday says, Hey, look, I've been thinking about this, you know, <laughs> and, and says, I, I don't think this is a good idea. Then I, like no hard feelings from, you yeah. know, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, I get it. It's like, totally makes sense. Whereas, you know, any other time that, that that's going to be met with a little more, uh, questioning and grilling. Like, what do you mean we should cancel the gig? Like, you know, right. but right now it's like, yeah, no, I get it. Okay. No problem. Yep. Moving on. And, and I, you know, I think we're all on the same page with that. We haven't, I don't have, we tested this theory. We might have already, in fact, and I think it's been fine. Yeah. But it, yeah. it keeps evolving. Yeah. So I, I can transition into what I wanted to talk about really well. Yeah, man. You set it up well. So, so in our band, there's kind of two things like COVID has become the second thing that is like, no, I'm not going to cajole you into going along with what the majority of the band wants when it's a COVID thing, right? Sure. Your yeah, exactly. Health, 
yep. you're healthy, you're right. Yep. And then the other thing is typically uh, day job stuff. I don't, I don't pressure people about something that compromises a day job situation in order for the band to do something, right? So yeah. if I book a gig and a guy, I can't get off work early enough, you know, I, I'm not going to say you have to, you know, or anything like that. So that, those would be the two types of situations where, so COVID being a new thing, but, you know, day job stuff is also the other. But it it brings to mind um, a whole bunch of thoughts about a band and how a band operates most effectively when everybody's on the same page about stuff and the realization that like a, a really great band, like a really great band is something that achieves being more than the sum of its parts. And what I mean by that is like, you may have five, four good players, three good players, five good players, you know, your band may be all good players. Sure. But if you don't get something more out of the combination of all those people, you're probably doing it wrong or you're not achieving what you possibly could. I, you know, you, you would have to say the Beatles would be the most obvious example of something like that. Like would, would, would them, if the, if the serendipity that brought those four guys together hadn't coerced on them, you know, w- would any of them have reached the heights that they met otherwise? Yeah, no, I think, but I think that's true of so many bands. But, in but fact, I'm saying that that is the secret sauce about what yeah. the band to a certain level. And in many ways, and I, I, I'm bringing this around because with regards to my band, so the, the change in structure to my band, um, me moving away, being that change in structure COVID Got aside, it. but me, yeah. me moving away, you know, has meant that there's holes in guys' calendars now. Musicians don't like holes in their calendars, and so they're filling the hole. Sure. We had a, a point, I'm going to get back to this in a second. We had a, we had a big band fight, probably one of our biggest band fights, several, maybe 10 years ago, right? Okay. Everybody has a band fight, so I don't think, I don't think, you know. No, 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 any, it happens. Right? Yep. Happens. Um, and uh, my bass player, Steve, at the time, he was the one who said, listen, we have all got to get our hands around the fact that this thing that we've created is bigger than the sum of all of us. We've all contributed to that, but it is this thing that, you know, the, the, the combination of all of our skills has created something that has brought us all more success than we've had in other realms of our music lives. And, you know, we, we, need, we really need to embrace that and understand that. You know, what's interesting when you started this conversation just, you know, moments ago, and started down this path of band greater than the sum of its parts. And, and my first response to you was, well, I think that's true of every band. And then we kept talking and I, I have a little notepad here that I, I jot thoughts down on so that I can get them out of my head and continue listening to what you're saying. Right. And the thing that I wrote there was self-awareness slash band, meaning oh, yeah. band awareness of that. So yes, I think most bands the, the, the fact that the, when a band gets to the point that it's greater than the sum of its parts, that's what makes it a band, right? That's what makes you good or one of the things. However, if you as a band are not aware, it, that can be true without you knowing it. And if everybody in the band is not keenly aware that the band is more important than any one member, then that's when you have problems, and and you're like you're 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 giving a shining example of exactly that, right? Did you see the movie? Of course, you saw the movie. That thing you do. Oh yeah, of course. Yes. Okay, <laughs> so that, that's a great a great band movie of which you know there were they went through that evolution. You know, there was the one guy who had a different artistic view that as time grew on, you know, he 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 thought about him. Yep. There was the one guy who was the band guy who was like, no, you know, we are we're a team. We're you know. I think that that's a really accurate makeup of most bands. I, I, I know a lot of bands who say they're a brotherhood or a family or those types of things. Uh, but I also know that once you peel back the onion a little bit, most bands have a mix of combinations of personalities, some narcissistic, some em- overly empathetic, you know, like there's a whole bunch of things going on. Everybody is not exactly the same view no. of, of what the sum of the parts are. And, and, in that, uh, in that difference is sometimes you get magic out of that. You know, sometimes, you know, the, the narcissistic guy inspires the empathetic guy, you know, and the, and the empathetic guy reminds the narcissistic guy, hey, you're, you're a part of a team here of people yep. who care about you and want you to succeed and, you know, that type of thing. And, it's, you know, that's, that's what band life is. It's a constant tension. I know, 
you know, in, in most bands, um, people like to say, you know, we're, we're a family or we're a brotherhood or we're those types of things. But I also know if you were to go down the line and ask people, why is your band successful? You will get a variety of, of opinions. And and embedded in some of those opinions will be because of me, right? Like, yeah. like I'm the I'm the key, or I'm the or key. He's the key, right? right? Yeah, yeah, so right, right. You don't have to go too far into that conversation to realize that it is a very fragile thing. And I always think about that Steve Van Zandt quote about like if you get a band that works, do everything you can to keep it together because it's such a rare thing. It is. I I'm reminded this guy, and I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm reminded of Joe Walsh's moment one of joe walsh's moments in the uh, history of the eagles documentary that came out i don't know about 10 years ago or whatever it was and you know joe walsh came into the eagles as a brand name a household name right like he had a pedigree coming in yeah and an ego to, like <laughs> you know pretty big one uh and yet at one point in the movie he said oh yeah no i, I like i realized early on that whatever's best for the eagles is more important than what's best for me. Mm. And just the fact that he was able to, like, that was eye-opening for me. It was like, oh, wow. Like, this guy, he's right, first of all. He's totally right. And the fact that that guy noticed it and figured well, it out, that's yeah. huge. I just I just finished reading Steve Van Zandt's autobiography, which is a really interesting read, right? Yep. And he has this one admission that is the, the key part of the book to me where he says, you know, when I quit the band, the E Street band, right before, yeah, <laughs> right before they went on Born in the USA success tour, right? You know, when they were about to hit their highest, he goes, "You know what? The lesson, life lesson, there is: you never abandon your power base. All the things I wanted mm -hmm. to do in life, all the creative things, would have been so much easier if I was stayed in that power. You know, if I <laughs> stayed a member of the E Street band and was able to just leverage these other things that I wanted to do. So." Yeah. I, I do think, you know, a, a good working band that gives people, um, uh, gives the individuals awareness, you know, the, the, people get their fan bases. Being associated with something that is, that is, that, that is really successful is an incredibly powerful um, leveraging point. You can create other opportunities once you have that, but it is stunning when you don't have that, how quickly the opportunities can, you're, you're just one of the other people out there trying to make something happen. Right? Well, geez, now you're, now you're convincing me that maybe I shouldn't have sold the Mac observer. Ah. Recently. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was a guy. It's, it's an interesting parallel, but I, I, I do not think that I, I think actually the sale was a really good thing for the business and for everybody involved. But, but it's like, like those were some of the thoughts that went through my head early on in that process of like, wait, like, what, what am I giving? What is my future? Not the financial, you know, uh, benefits of having that business, but what are the intangibles, you know, the opportunities that that would open up, you know, because I'm affiliated with it. And I had to right. wrap my head around the fact that, well, uh, I think at this point, everybody that that needs to know knows that I co-founded it and we ran it for 23 years. And I think mm -hmm. that's enough. But that was that like there was I had to get to the point where I was comfortable saying, I think that's enough. Yeah. But yeah, I, I would say the difference in these situations are. Steve Van Zant was a sideman. Joe Walsh was a side, although a very important one, sideman. You're the creator and the kind of author of that stuff. So that's true. You know, fair. So I, fair. I think it's I think it'd be different. You know, yep. Perspective from Henley or Springsteen's perspective yeah. on that. But I think I think that the concept of a band where, you know, it, it's, if it's one of those democratic situations where everybody's a side band, you know, to the whole, yeah. that's one dynamic that you got to kind of understand. But I don't know. I, I, I do think that the goal is to get in those situations where the the combination of talents creates something that you can't do. I, I know, like I, I do my solo stuff, which has got a different vibe and it's satisfying. And I've tried to put together other things and even with some pretty good players, but I can feel that it's not the same. I can feel that it's side guys who are there for coming through my life, you know, and it's not going to be an ongoing thing, right? Yeah. So, right. yeah, I, I, I can feel that it's a different thing. Yeah. 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 
It's it, it's interesting, I, you know, bands that evolve and stay the to stay being the same band. It, like, I, it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. All right, real quick question for you. Yeah, so, man. have you ever played in a situation where everybody had very vibrant other situations going on? Oh yeah, yeah. I would say m many situations I've been in have been that way. Yeah. Are you are you in one now? I would. Yeah, I would say that like. Looking at Bitter Pill, right? Like, you know, Billy's got, uh, well, he's got his theater stuff going on. He's got his band with his brother going on. Uh, John, our guitar player, is in like 14 other bands. He he makes me look like a slouch in terms of how many things I do. I'm in like one or two other bands in addition to Bitter Pill. And 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 everybody kind of has their thing. So, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a fair assessment of that scenario. Yeah. And in those situations, are there written or unwritten rules about what's cool or not cool to do in like, like how much overlap? Like, like if yeah. your guitar player who's, who's in Bitter Pill is playing Bitter Pill songs in, in his other groups, would everybody be like, but those are Bitter Pill songs? Or would he be like, no, those are songs. They belong to everybody. So like, um, like what, what is, what is healthy when you have a bunch of working musicians that are different, that are doing different things. Well, these are, these are original bands. And I think most of the, well, the, the side, I call it a side project, the other project. I don't want to minimize anything. The, the blues band that Billy's in with his brother is, uh, I mean, they're playing blues songs. So I, th I, I think they have some originals in there, but there's also some blues standards that they're, you know, quite a bit of blues standards that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Uh John, the guitar player, plays in a bunch of other projects, most of which are original bands. But he's got a he's got a couple of cover projects that that happen in there. But so for somebody to take a, a bitter pill tune and play it in one of these other things, I don't even know that it would it would have to be it wouldn't bother me. First of all, especially like take John, a guitar player. You know, if it was especially if it was a song that he wrote, like you know this. Um, Jesus going to pay my tab, which I think is a great title all by itself. And the song's even mm -hmm. better. Uh, but you know, if he wanted to play in that in another band, like, okay, well that's, I mean, that's fine. It's his tune. Billy's tunes have been used in so many different things of his over the years that it wouldn't seem strange to me for him to do that. Now it would seem strange for any of us to create something that was playing the same material like it, like it'd be it's one thing if it's like one song here or there right but if it was a band playing all, like the majority of the same material that would be a little weird because we're you know we're like cannibalizing what we're doing without That's a good word right so like like it would it would not be weird to throw one in here or there it, to me at all, but it would be weird if it was like, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, start this other project where we're playing all these same songs with different musicians. It's like, well, w which band do people go to see if they want to see those songs? Like, no, that's yeah. kind of weird. Like, you know, I, I mean, there might be a good answer to that question, but it's a, it's a question worth asking. Yeah. So I, I think Viva La Difference, I think, you know, what I was saying before about a band and the sum of its parts, yeah, that that takes some care and feeding. You know, that takes some sure cognizance by the band members that that thing that you have that is succeeding and is special should be treated as special. It should be, you know, it's a unique thing, and and yeah. do whatever you can to keep it special, right? Yeah, um, to kind of nip it and be like, well, you know, here's 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 a subset of that, but I'm doing it in a totally different you know format. Personally. I don't think that's, I don't think that's terribly useful. It, it, what, if you want to take it out to a, a larger concept, like if you have a five piece band and, uh, and, and the band members all have, you know, side projects because they want to work as much as possible. Why not have each of those side projects just have a kind of like implied agreement that, you know, we're all going to do complementary things. And the only place where people can see this is when the five of us together. I, I think that's a smarter way to do things. It serves a lot of purposes. And also, Dave, you know, there's, there's a, it, it, we're going to talk about covers. There are a lot of songs out there. It's kind of funny. We talk about GB and we just kind of almost now use it as a throwaway term. Like, oh yeah, yeah, there's this book and everybody should know it. And yeah. these are the songs that go over very well. You know, there really are more songs than that that can go over well. I mean, there, you know, there, there should be hundreds of those types of songs, not, not 20 of those types of songs. And um, 
there's no reason that the GB book shouldn't be brimming over for everybody. And if you're in a group where, you know, people are doing multiple things that you can divide that book up and say, you know, you specialize in the eighties and nineties repertoire. I'll do Motown, you know, that type of thing. Sure. And you know, I, I just think that that's a healthier way to do it. I value uniqueness, right? It is frustrating to me as an artist who wants to see a scene flourish, uh, that, every, that people are playing the same songs. And it is really frustrating to me when I try and find a song through whatever means, you know, research or, you know, listening to other song lists or listening to people in other parts of the country or whatever it may be. And I know that nobody in my area is doing a certain song and I really work hard to prepare it out. And there's some musicians in the audience and then it shows up in their, in their next song. Yeah. Right. I, I don't want to be that guy who steals songs from other people. I want to try and find, you know, an original path of doing things. Does this sound like whining or does this sound like, like, you know, is, is it overly slicing a hair because I think not so. the cover songs to begin with? I, I think, yeah, I mean, if you, what you just said, and I, 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 I'd have to go back and listen to the tape to, to actually hear, but you said, I want to do something original. Well, then like there is a path, <laughs> there is a path for that. Right. Um, and, and just for anybody that like me, when I first heard the term had no idea what GB means, general business songs. That's what GB means. This was a term that was completely foreign to me until I moved to New Hampshire and then everybody was talking about it. And finally, after like a year, I'm like, guys, I know all these songs aren't just in G and B. Like you guys are playing guitars. I can see what chords you're playing. What the heck does GB mean? And Bill, the guitar player and knockoff laughed at me. He's like, Oh yeah, man, that's general business. I'm like, yeah. got it. Okay. So just in case you hadn't heard that term, but yeah, I think we're over slicing a hair here. Like when, when I was playing in chafed, right. Uh, Chafed was a five piece band and covers all covers. And it was mostly, you know, 90s stuff. Cause that's what, uh, what Johnny knows and sings really well. And, uh, and it worked, you know, it was eighties and nineties, I should say. And then some stuff that was newer, but really kind of targeted there. And, uh, and then from that Johnny and Jimmy, and then eventually me, uh, but it was Johnny and Jimmy who spun off uh, monkey fist and monkey fist was billed as acoustic chafed. So it was intended to be mostly the same song list, just different types of venues, right? You can't bring a full, you know, five piece loud rock band into a tiny little coffee shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, okay, well, you get the same singer and one of the guitar players. And then eventually, you know, this guy banging on a, a, a pitch slap and, you know, away you go. And, mm -hmm. and so like that worked and people got a different vibe of that material. And there were songs that we would do in monkey fist, especially as it evolved that we didn't do in chafed. And, and of course some songs that we would do in chafed that just wouldn't work acoustic and didn't translate well. So we just wouldn't do those, but you know, by and large, it was probably 70%, 60% the same song list uh, to pull from it on any given night. And it worked out fine. It was, but it was, it was a, it was a conscious decision of the band or at least, Everybody was sort of in on it. It happened just as I was joining. So I really wasn't actually a part of that decision, but everybody was sort of on board and, and monkey fist was always sort of a, a moving, the, the lineup of monkey fist was always a, a, a kind of an evolving thing. And it was generally John, uh, Johnny D John Donahue singing cause he was the singer, but then it could be anybody else from Chafed and then eventually some other people. So it wasn't just Jimmy on guitar and me. Sometimes it would be Maddie on guitar and Steve might show up. Our bass player would show up and play percussion for the night or something because he's a pretty good mm -hmm. percussionist. You know, so it was just whatever two or three members of Chafed you could get, throw them together, put them in a, you know, coffee house corner with a with a PA and you're good to go. Right. So. Uh, so maybe that's a little bit different than what you're talking about, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's the same exact thing. I don't know. I. I never saw that as cannibalizing, though, um, because it it was it was almost serving to keep the the brand name going when you know when when we couldn't have an, a, a full electric gig or whatever. It was like, all right, well, no, I totally start. get it, and you know, and maybe so. maybe that's the angle to take on this is like take that concept of cannibalizing and hold it up to the light and decide, you know, how you feel about that in your yeah. band. Yeah. Ask the you question, know? right? Be self-aware about it to go back to the other conversation. Like, don't just do it, do it with awareness and intention. And if it makes intention. sense, then great. But if, it, if yeah. you're just doing it because it's the easy button, 
maybe that's not the right idea. Maybe it cannibalizes what you're doing elsewhere. Maybe it's not smart, but I don't think there's a universal answer to that. I think it's ask the question, you know, hold, like you said, hold it up like to the it. light. Yeah. I, I like think it. that's the right yeah. answer. Yeah, man. Yeah, it. Good. yeah. It's good. Ah, that's what I got today. I got to, I got to learn some songs, relearn some songs, make sure my hands Your own work. songs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> that's always the interesting part about this phase of things. And I remember this from, you know, when I was in go figure and like, Every original band I've been in where you're, we're putting out records and, and writing material and, you know, the studio is a part of that. It's like, oh, yeah, those first couple of gigs after the, the record's been recorded, those are the tough ones because, you know, this crazy person wrote these drum parts and it's like, oh, yeah, I don't remember, uh, you know, <laughs> I remember what I did. I, thank goodness yeah. we recorded it. So I get to go back and listen. But, yeah, it, but it's fun. Like, I like that part of it. It's, it. You know, in a sense, it's almost like learning covers. But I do know the songs like, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago that we recorded them with with Bitter Pill. Uh, the last record when we put out Desperate Times on the New Hampshire State Line that we recorded and put out, we recorded it right before lockdown. We put it out during lockdown. And so months went by before we played a gig with and some of those tunes had never been played live. So that was a trick, like going back and being like. I have no recollection of this drum part. Like, okay, I got to figure this out, <laughs> but makes it fun. Makes it fun. Yep. Uh, yep. Luck. Yeah. So hopefully the gig happens. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. You know, like it's a weird time. Things are evolving. It's how it goes, but I hope it happens. It was really nice. Billy sent out the set list last week and, uh, you know, just, a, a, which is early, earlier than it normally would happen. But he was like, look, we're not going to have a rehearsal. So don't wait until Friday to look at this. You know, I want to put this together now. If there's anything on here that anybody says, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I think, I think that's a bad idea. Speak now and we'll tweak it out, you know? And uh, it was just so nice. Like, I, you know, I just went into the, the Google drive that we have and pulled up the set list and looking at it and just the way it was formatted and everything. It was like every other set list from bitter pill. But it's been months since we've played and it was just such a nice thing to be like, oh, this is normal. Like, oh, I remember this. This is like part of the gig routine. I really like this. Like, you know, it was just, I don't know. I, I, got, I got all sappy looking at it. Like, so, but it was great. And I texted Billy. I'm like, this is amazing. He's like, right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is good. That's good. Cool. Yeah, man. You got anything else? That's what I got. All right. Viva la difference. Viva la difference. Yeah, man. Some of the parts. Some of the parts. Yeah, the difference of the parts. That's what it is. All right, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. In fact, we have a note from Scott that I'm going to wait and, and read next episode so that we can dig into it a little bit more. But uh, but yeah, send in your stuff. We, we love to hear from you. So please do that. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Hope you have Stay a good safe, week. Stay safe, Dave. Thanks, man. Always be performing, Dave. Always, always, always.